MedCram. Welcome to another MedCram video. So what is Disease X? Is it an ailment that you get from posting too much on a platform called X? No, actually. Disease X is no laughing matter, and it's being discussed at the World Economic Forum meeting in Davos, Switzerland. They're discussing possible future pandemics, and that's what Disease X is. It's a placeholder. Specifically, it's one where there could be even 20 times more deadly than we saw here with the last COVID-19 pandemic. According to this article that was published, they are building readiness to tackle the next pandemic and working out how to prevent the collapse of national healthcare infrastructure, as was seen in many countries in 2020, and now has become a critical objective for the WHO. So which viruses could this be? Some of the ones that they've talked about is potentially a resurgence of COVID-19. Could be Ebola, the Zika virus, Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, otherwise known as MERS, and Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, or the SARS, the very first SARS uh, virus that we saw back in 2002. So here are a couple more quotes from the article. Many people think it could be a coronavirus like SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes the illness with COVID-19, or a new strain of influenza. They also said, quote, the concept of disease X was one of the lessons we learned from this COVID pandemic, says Dr. Thomas Russo, an infectious diseases expert at the University of Buffalo Jacobs School of Medicine and Biomedical Sciences. He said, quote, as mankind breaks down these barriers between humans and other species through live animal markets and deforestation, we need continued surveillance and studies and improved biosecurity across the world. And he also finished with disease X could also turn out to be a brand new pathogen, not yet known even among animals. There's been a lot of discussion about not only that, but also lab leak theory and a host of other viruses and diseases that are now being analyzed across the world. And those are all very good topics to discuss, but we're not discussing it here in this video. What I'd like to discuss is what we can do specifically to be prepared for this next pandemic whenever it is, because it's probably just a matter of time. And the article continues, quote, building readiness to tackle the next pandemic and working out how to prevent the collapse of national healthcare infrastructure, as was seen in many countries in 2020, has now become a critical objective for the WHO. They say that UK scientists have said that a vaccine for a new virus with pandemic potential could be developed in as little as 100 days. I'm a little unsure about that. It took us about a year in this last one, and that was when everything was lining up well. They say here that in August last year, researchers from the University of Oxford announced that they were examining how to adapt the vaccine it created for COVID-19 for disease X. They will also examine how other vaccines could be developed to thwart future threats. I think it's nice that they're looking at this. I'm not so sure that we would be able to have a vaccine within 100 days of detecting an outbreak. I guess it depends on which virus it is. If it's a brand new virus, that's going to be difficult. However, if it's a variant of one that we already know, or even let's say it's influenza, something that we're very familiar with, that might be a possibility, but it's unclear exactly how that would happen. So the purpose of this video is to go over how we as individuals can be prepared. What can we do? And I'll tell you what I think is important and what I'm doing and the rationale for what it is that I'm doing to be prepared for the next pandemic. In this video, what we're going to do is go over what I believe is going to happen in the next pandemic and what we're going to need to know and be prepared for for the next pandemic so that we're not caught flat foot. So you all probably remember when we first heard that SARS-CoV-2 was in the United States and it was making the rounds, there was an emergency shutdown of the United States to try to prevent spread of the virus to major cities and cause an outbreak when we did not have medications or vaccines. And so this is an article that was published in the Washington Post in early 2023 by Joel Achenbach. America shut down in response to COVID. Would we ever do it again? The short answer is, is I don't think it would actually happen that way again. I think there's too many people that would be suspicious of that type of move, even though I think it might be the right move to do depending on the infectious nature of the disease. 
I do not think that preventing people from going to the park or going outside or getting into the sunshine, as we'll talk about, would be a good idea. And I think that in some cases, this social distancing or physical distancing, is probably is a better term, might have been taken a little bit too far. But I do believe that there was some benefit to this early on, not necessarily to justify shutdowns, but nevertheless, it did have an effect in that it slowed down the progression of SARS-CoV-2. I don't think we're going to see that in the next pandemic. And he says the same thing here, quote, this is not an esoteric dilemma. There are more pathogens out there poised to spill into the human species. A novel strain of avian influenza, H5N1, already has seized the attention of scientists as a potential spillover hazard. And it goes on to quote Robert Watcher, a professor of medicine at UC San Francisco, said that the opposition to emergency measures will emerge on day one of any new pandemic. It will create a tension and a level of pushback against any public health mandates to do anything. And what that means is, is that we're going to have higher and larger surges of infections than we did with COVID-19 early on in the pandemic. And in some states where vaccinations were low when we finally had them and distancing was not observed as well as it could have been, we saw that they actually instituted crisis protocols because the supply of healthcare at these institutions were outstripped by the demand. And these things happened well before healthcare vaccine mandates were instituted. I can remember specifically during the pandemic surges having a shortage of not only products, but also staff to take care of patients. For instance, we had plenty of hemodialysis machines, but not enough hemodialysis nurses to run them. And you can see here an article that we'll put a link to in the description below talking about the dialysis crisis that we had during the COVID-19 pandemic. So I've got here some issues that we probably will be dealing with if we did have another pandemic or a disease X. And as we've just shown you, lockdowns or isolation is probably not going to be as eventless or as quiet as it was before. And as a result of that, because these lockdowns likely will not be as complete or as long, we may have surges that come earlier and perhaps spread more rapidly as a result of that. And so because of that, there are going to be more people that are sick and there's going to be a higher demand for healthcare products and services. You can see that here in terms of our next pandemic. Also, as we had last time, possible hoarding of anticipated health products for personal use or for resale is going to be an issue. So there's going to be a shortage of supply of healthcare products like there was during the last pandemic. The availability of drugs will be low. The availability of drugs even right now without another illness is also low. We're actually running into issues of shortage. No studies on specific drugs for off-label use. So depending on what the next virus is, there's no telling if we're going to have any kind of studies that show that off-label medications is going to be available or even be able to be done. If one is considered, either by the medical industry or people in general, it's likely not going to be available because everyone will want to get that. Number three, supply chain may be disrupted both domestically and internationally. Many people responsible for transport could be either at home, contagious, ill, or even dead. These are some of the issues in terms of our supply chain. Items that require supply chain may not be available. And of course, what is available is going to be more valuable because it's scarce and that will increase in value. So a lack of medications like insulin, blood thinners, things that people are normally every day on when they don't get, they run into problems. They are also going to come to the hospital. That's going to be an issue as well. If vaccines are developed within 100 days, it still would be difficult to distribute it because as the new pandemic were to wear on, the supply chain would be more and more compromised. And that's exactly what you need to get those vaccines out to people. There would be limited, if any, testing because testing requires a supply chain to get those tests out to where they are needed. Many healthcare personnel may not be available, again, could be at home, contagious, ill, or dead, especially since those are going to be the ones taking care of the patients that are the sickest. So they're going to be the ones that are most likely to get the disease because they're at ground zero. And this could lead to crisis protocols being put in place at hospitals. The impact on law enforcement is going to be huge because they're going to be preventing people from using weapons in the hospital, looting, taking away personal freedoms of other people, etc., etc. 
So ideally, we would want to have access to standard of care medications, vaccines. It's great to have those things, but we can't depend 100% on having those things available. We believe in the Swiss cheese model, where you have multiple slices of cheese, each with their own holes in it, that are deficient. But if you have enough slices, you can compensate for that. And so we want to depend on as many things as possible because if we do have a situation where some of these things are not available, we're going to want to have a backup plan to be able to put into place. And so while it's great to have medications, hospitals, medical infrastructure, resources, we really want to be able to have those things. Sometimes it's also a good idea to, in addition to that, not in lieu of it, not instead of it, have things that are not dependent on a supply chain so that they won't go away when the supply chain goes down or not be dependent on a diagnosis or a test or not be dependent on a pharmacist dispensing it or not being able to be hoarded, something that is widely available and inexpensive, maybe even free and effective against a number of infectious agents that is very broad. So let's talk about some of those things and see what we come up with. And the first one is sunlight. So people who watch our MedCram channel would not be surprised. What I think you need to know here is that when we talk about sunlight, a lot of you will reflexively think, oh yes, vitamin D. Um, No. Sunlight and its effect on the human body is so much more than just vitamin D. Yes, it does give you vitamin D, but there's so much more. Here is influenza deaths per week in the United States. And this is looking through 2020, as you can see the different years here at the bottom going all the way through. Do you notice something that when the sun is the lowest in the sky, when you're getting the least amount of hours of sunlight, that's when you're getting these infectious deaths from influenza. And you know, it's not just influenza. No, just about all chronic lower respiratory diseases fluctuate with sunlight where it's worse in the wintertime. Not only that, but also heart disease, by the way, also. And just about every disease on this list here, other than accidents, seems to get worse in the wintertime. And that's actually been looked at, especially with COVID-19. There was this study that was published in Nature that looked at what about COVID-19 made it get worse in the wintertime in Europe. Was it the temperature, humidity, or latitude? When they looked at temperature, there was absolutely no correlation, flat line. Humidity, no correlation, flat line. But when they looked at latitude, they found that the first surge happened in Finland and then ended up in Greece as the autumn of 2020 went along, showing that it's really sunlight that causes these surges in COVID-19 to occur. They also looked at the United States, England, and Italy, And it showed that the higher in latitude you were in these countries, the worse the mortality rate. You can see here COVID-19 deaths per million, and it correlated the highest numbers with the least amount of light coming in. And this had nothing to do with vitamin D. Again, these were parts of the country in the wintertime that they were not getting enough vitamin D, so it had to be something else. The authors of this study, in conclusion, said that given that the effect appears independent of a vitamin D pathway, it suggests possible new COVID-19 therapies. Margaret Scutch, the geographist, and myself put a paper together looking at this globally and found the same thing with these countries here in cluster three having a slightly better mortality rate than these red countries here in cluster four. And the reason we believe is because of what's going on at the ACE2 receptor. So you can see here, ACE2 is hit by the virus and it stops the conversion of this pro-oxidant angiotensin 2 to this antioxidant angiotensin 1-7. This is supposed to really be helping you and what it does is it blocks or shuts down reactive oxygen species. When you're in the sun, melatonin helps out and blocks reactive oxygen species as well as melatonin at night when you're sleeping and not exposing your eyes to bright light. So this is the reason why we believe that during the day, sunlight is so important because of melatonin that is produced on site in the mitochondria to prevent this reactive oxygen species. And there's been a number of studies that have shown that in every age group, In COVID, higher levels of F2 isoprostane, which is a marker of oxidative damage. So this is pretty well understood. 
Of course, a lot of this could be association. So is there a randomized controlled trial looking at infrared light in COVID-19? And the answer to that is yes. This was a paper that was published at the end of December in 2022. And in this paper, they used an LED jacket, basically, to produce near-infrared light on patients with moderate COVID that were hospitalized. And what they found was that those that were randomized to the jacket being turned on had four days less admission, better outcomes in terms of their hematological numbers, so they had better lymphocytes, they had better oxygenation, better pulmonary function testing, and overall got out of the hospital four days earlier. I've had the opportunity to treat some patients in my local hospital with COVID-19 with this. And notice what you see here is that when you're outside, generally speaking, this is the spectrum of the sun that you get. And while it does have some near-infrared light, more than zero, if you look here outside when you're surrounded by green trees and leaves, you get much higher levels of near-infrared radiation. So being outside in the sunlight surrounded by green trees and leaves is going to give you a super boost of near-infrared radiation. This is what I believe is going on. Not only do we believe that near-infrared radiation is beneficial for COVID, but it's also beneficial for a number of diseases because it has a final common pathway of improving melatonin and antioxidants in the mitochondria, which we believe are involved in a number of different infections. So you might say that this is relatively new discoveries, and in the 21st century, it might be. But if you look back, this is something that people have done for a long time. People were very good at observing outcomes based on interventions, even though they might not have had the same technology as we have had. Observationally, back in the early 1900s and in the 1800s, it was well established that getting people outside into sunlight, getting people outside into fresh air around green trees and leaves was shown to improve the health of the patients. So in case you think that this is only good for, for instance, SARS-CoV-2 and not influenza, let me draw your attention here to the Harvard Kennedy School research titled Sunlight and Protection Against Influenza that was done by David J. G. Slusky and Richard J. Zeckhauser. And you can see printed right in the abstract of their paper, they say here that we find that sunlight strongly protects against getting influenza. So let's see here, in addition to standard of care, if sunlight is beneficial. So if we came down with something of a pandemic nature that we've talked about here, going to the hospital, having the ability to have vaccinations, medications, things of that nature is going to be good. But let's see if sunlight fits the criteria of something that we could add to that that would be robust against some of these incursions. Is it dependent on a supply chain? It is not dependent on a supply chain. It is not dependent on a diagnosis or test. It's not dependent on a pharmacist dispensing it. It cannot be hoarded. It's widely available and free. And as we've shown here, it's effective against a number of infectious agents. By the way, you can also look at some of our other videos such as Light as Medicine and the case for COVID and also this one called Infrared Light Neutralizes Spike Toxicity. It talks about how toll-like receptor 4 is neutralized with sunlight and infrared radiation and that is the mechanism that is implied with spike protein. Let's talk about another intervention that one can do that fits those criteria and this one is hydrotherapy. And this is encouraging a healthy, innate immune system response. So there's actually three barriers or three parts to your immune system. Of course, there's the physical barrier, which is your skin and your mucosa and all those sorts of things. And then what's left is the innate immune system here and the adaptive immune system. The adaptive immune system is the part of the immune system that specifically gets proteins presented to it and makes antibodies. We're familiar with that because that's how the vaccines seem to work. 
However, the innate immune system can recognize things that are foreign without actually having seen them before. So that's why it's really important for your innate immune system to be working. If this is SARS-CoV-2, or if this is influenza, or if this is Zika virus, or Marburg virus, all of these infectious agents are going to be recognized as being foreign by the innate immune system. And let me tell you, the innate immune system is so powerful, it's so difficult to get around, that for a human being to be infected by a virus, the virus has to have some sort of neutralization system in place to neutralize aspects of the innate immune system. The one that is the most common, if you look at different types of viruses, is it neutralizes a specific aspect of the innate immune system that secretes interferon. Interferon is a substance that is secreted by your innate immune system that is very broad, it is very powerful, and it can overcome many, many different types of viruses. To give you an example, interferon is the medication that we give. We copy the body's ability to make interferon and give it at higher doses, and this is the medication that we actually give patients with chronic hepatitis C, which is caused by a virus, to cure them. Interferon, at high enough levels, when given to patients with hepatitis C, can actually cure a chronic viral infection. That is how powerful interferon is. As it turns out, interferon is the barrier that viruses most often like to neutralize. Let's see how that turns out here. Very early on in the COVID-19 pandemic, there was this paper that was published by Nancy Argo, PhD, and she says here that studies of SARS and MERS suggest that the interferon response is delayed compared with coronaviruses that cause mild disease and with milder cases of these two coronaviruses that can cause severe disease, the patients with severe SARS or severe MERS had higher viral loads and delayed interferon responses. Thus, it could be that the patients most susceptible to severe disease are those that cannot mount an effective early antiviral immune response. A study of 50 patients with cases ranging from mild to severe found that gene expression profiles indicating type 1 and type 2 interferon responses were highest in patients with mild to moderate disease and were low in patients with severe or critical disease. A similar difference in type 1 interferon activity was detected in the serum from patients. Patients with more severe disease had less type 1 interferon activity in their blood. Interferon is the cornerstone of getting rid of viruses from the body, and that is chiefly regulated by the innate immune system. And here is a study that was published in the prestigious journal Science, and you can see here very clearly that if you look at interferon levels, that those with mild disease had the highest levels of interferon, and those with critical disease had the lowest levels. SARS-CoV-2 has a gene in it called MAC1 that is specifically there to make and antagonize the body's ability to get rid of it using interferon. And here's a study that looks at MAC1, and what they did was they took this SARS-CoV-2 and they made some mutations and deletions in this MAC1 gene, and they wanted to see how well it would infect humanized mice. And they looked at the bronchial cells and the alveolar cells. The bronchial cells are the tubes that go down into the lung, and the alveolar cells are the cells at the bottom where gas exchange occurs. And notice here what happens. Here we're looking at all of the good things your innate immune system is going to secrete, all of this cytokines and specifically interferon. Here we can see interferon as well. We see that in blue is the wild type. That's WT. That's the normal situation. Notice that the wild type virus causes there to be a very small secretion of these interferons. Whereas when we do the Delta MAC1, we put a mutation in MAC1 so it can no longer do its dirty business. We now have increases in interferon showing that it's MAC1 that allows this virus, SARS-CoV-2, to do its dirty business without having to deal with interferon. 
So scientists caught on to this and they thought, well, maybe we should just give injections of long acting interferon in patients to see if they would do better. And in fact, that's exactly what they did. This was a paper that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine titled Early Treatment with Pegylated Interferon Lambda for COVID-19. So what happens if we give interferon to patients with COVID-19? Do they get better? Do they get worse? Do we reduce hospitalizations? Let's take a look. Yes, indeed. It did not matter if the patients were vaccinated or unvaccinated. There was about a 50% reduction in hospitalizations or ED visits, showing that if you either turn off the gene in the virus that suppresses interferon, or if you can turn on interferon despite the gene in SARS-CoV-2, there is an improvement in the severity of the disease and a reduction in hospitalization. The problem is you would need to have a supply chain to give subcutaneous interferon. So what do we do? We would like to find a way of increasing the body's interferon without having to give a medication that requires a supply chain. And so this paper that was published took human volunteers and they took their lymphocytes out of their body and subjected them to a stimulus similar to a viral infection at different body temperatures to find out which body temperature was the best in terms of secreting interferon. Remember, interferon is that thing that we need to cripple and to get rid of of the viral infection and reduce hospitalizations. So let's take a look at that. Here's interferon on the y-axis and core body temperature. And we're starting off in Celsius, 37, 37.5, 38, 38.5. At 39, which is around 102 degrees Fahrenheit, there was a 10-fold increase in interferon, which was substantial. Here's the amount of interferon released from lymphocytes after mitogen stimulation that simulates a viral infection at different body temperatures. And 39 was where it really took off. And there are several ways of doing this. So a hot bath, otherwise known as hydrotherapy. This is a photograph that was taken at the Battle Creek Sanitarium back in the 1910s. That's just 100 years ago. And physicians were using this technique to get patients to increase interferon, even though they had no idea that that was the mechanism. But what they did know was that it worked. By the way, I would be remiss if I didn't show you here in the same Battle Creek Sanitarium, a light box so people could get light up there in Michigan in the wintertime. Here again, hydrotherapy done at the Battle Creek Sanitarium. You can see it was very labor intensive. It was not as easy as passing out medications, but remember that there weren't that many medications in 1910. And this was actually the state-of-the-art therapy because of research that was going on at the time. And so you might say, well, hydrotherapy may work if it increases interferon for SARS-CoV-2, but what about some of the other major players of disease X? What about influenza? And so we have to remember that it was around this time in 1918 that we had the world's very large pandemic in 1918, which was influenza. And a very smart up-and-coming medical director of a sanitarium in the northeast of the United States, a gentleman by the name of Wells A. Rubel, thought that this was an excellent opportunity to try out this technique of hydrotherapy on these patients with influenza. And so that's exactly what he did. So in addition to rest, fresh air, getting them out into sunlight, they also, in their patients in the sanitarium, did hydrotherapy on them. And we've talked about this before, but you can see compared to the army hospitals where there was heavy use of aspirin, the sanitariums had one-sixth of the fatality rate that was going on in the army hospitals. And what were they doing? Hydrotherapy, fresh air, rest, sleep, sunshine, etc. There was even a story of a number of students at a seminary that came down with the Spanish flu where they were immediately started on hydrotherapy and amazingly not a single student was lost to the disease. 
this was not out of the ordinary. This was actually the state-of-the-art treatments for a number of conditions. There was a condition called neurosyphilis, which was identified in a psychiatric institution by Dr. Wagner Yoreg, who found that patients who had high fevers seemed to get better from their neurosyphilis. And so you can see here, Dr. Wagner Yoreg, this gentleman here with his hands on this patient's shoulder right here, He's the one that came up with this idea of injecting blood that was compatible with the patient with malaria to cause the patient to have high fevers. Now, they have the treatment for malaria, but what they were hoping is that the high fevers would induce the innate immune system and cause it to rise up and get rid of the neurosyphilis chronic infection. Well, that's exactly what happened. And because of this, Dr. Wagner Yoreg received the Nobel Prize in Medicine in 1927 from the work that he had done back in 1917. Ironically, it was the very next year, in 1928, that penicillin was discovered. And Fleming got the Nobel Prize in that. And you can imagine now that it was much easier to give medications to patients with infections than it was to do this laborious type of work of injecting malaria or doing hot tubs or hydrotherapy. And so over the decades, with the institution of randomized controlled trials and pharmaceutical companies, it was much easier to pour resources into treating these diseases with medications. And what was lost was the understanding and the art of some of these things that we used to do 100 years ago with sunshine, fresh air, and hydrotherapy. And the genius there is that we're using the body's ability to fight a number of different diseases, but simply enhancing it and making it better able to deal with these diseases, rather than depending 100% on medications that require a supply chain, prescriptions, and are not always available. So let's do our checklist for hydrotherapy. Let's see if hydrotherapy fits the criteria here now. Is it dependent on a supply chain? Well, you do need hot water and towels, and so it would be a good idea to have at least those things available. You know, a sauna, a hot tub, these are also things that you might not be able to get at the time, but if you have them already, it might be worthwhile. It's not dependent on a diagnostic test. You don't need a pharmacist to dispense it. You can't hoard hot water. You can use it, of course, it's available. You do need a heat source, a microwave or an oven or a stove. You could even use fire safely outside. It's widely available. I would almost say it's free, depending on the fuel costs. And as we said here, it's been shown to be useful, at least historically, in things like the 1918 Spanish flu pandemic. So I would say, yes, it does fit the criteria for being a hedge against when these things start to fall and having something as a backup. If you want to learn more about hydrotherapy, check out our video, Interferon COVID and Hydrotherapy, New Studies. And those are the two major things that I wanted to talk about, but there are other things that fit under that category. And let me just briefly mention it to you. So we've talked about a number of things, including sunlight and hydrotherapy, but there are things that we could talk about. We could talk about nutrition. There is a number of studies that we've talked about that showed that a plant-based diet is actually superior and found that the inflammation is less and the chances of getting severe COVID is almost up to four times less when on a whole grain plant-based diet. We've shown that exercise can improve inflammation, reduce the incidence of upper respiratory diseases when done in a moderately ranged amplitude and not overdoing it. We've shown that sleep is beneficial, especially with antibody responses, getting seven to eight hours per night, and also fresh air and the phytoncides and the substances that are given off by trees and things of that nature. Again, all of these things that we're talking about here are things that do not need a supply chain, a diagnosis or a test, a pharmacist can't be hoarded, widely available and is effective against a number of infectious agents. So I hope you've enjoyed this video. I know it can be pretty scary, but I want you to be aware that if these things are happening, it's going to be important to know how to not only help yourself, but also help others around you. The main ingredients for that are here in this video. If you enjoyed this, please subscribe, turn on notifications, leave us a comment about other ideas. And if you are a healthcare provider and need continuing medical education units or just continuing ed, go to medcram.com to sign up. Even if you're not a healthcare provider and want to learn more about how to treat patients and the education that's involved, medcram.com. We have a number of videos on EKG, congestive heart failure, 
failure, the interpretation of x-rays, ABGs, EKG, as, as we mentioned. Thanks for joining us.